Gracious God, we are honored and love you today. We thank you for this day that you have given us, Lord. We ask in the moments that we have all gathered together uh, to discuss and to, di to dialogue that you would lead us by your spirit, Father. You've told us what is required of us to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly before you. Help us to do that in these moments. Help us, Lord, Father, to not just dialogue, not just be hearers, but be doers. Help us to come up with viable and quantifiable solutions to begin to address the things that lie in front of us. Lord, help us as Paul instructed us to reason together, Father. Help us, Lord, ultimately to come out with some efficacious solutions that help us uh, to deal with the issue that lies before us and the welfare of African-American men in particular and our culture and our race and even our society, Father. Ultimately, the ill that lies in front of us is not one of race or culture, but it's a sin issue. And so help us, Lord, to speak to that today in all that we do. Of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen? Amen. Well, thank you so much for joining us today at our forum here, hosted by Grove Church, under the pastorate of Dr. Melvin O'Mariner. Real men, real talk. As I said in our opening prayer, our goal today is to begin a dialogue hopefully leads to some real solutions uh, that we can do something with today. Um, let me give you uh, a little bit uh, of an overview of how we got to this point. Uh, then I'll uh, take up some housekeeping issues and then finally we'll introduce our panel, our esteemed panel today, and we will uh, begin. Uh, all of this started, the reason we're here today, uh, we had a discussion with uh, our men's ministry leaders uh, who are with us today. Brothers, if you would stand up. Minister Edwards, Brother G. Roy, if you'll stand up with us. Uh, Minister James Edwards, Brother G. Roy Mays, and in his absence, uh, he couldn't be here with us today. Minister Greg Booth, the leaders of our men's ministry, were discussing uh, what can we do to bridge uh, the gap in our estimation between our younger men and our more seasoned men. Uh, and that discussion uh, kind of was taken over by things that begin to happen in the media. Y'all can be seated. Thank you so much. Uh, the uh, Michael Brown, Eric Garner, deaths, subsequent grand jury verdicts, Tamir Rice's killing in Cleveland, and others that you can call also. That kind of took over our discussion and kind of morphed it into something a little bit broader than just even that significant topic, bridging the gap. And so we end up here uh, today. This, this developed and created this momentum, and our senior pastor got in on that dialogue, and we came up with this idea that we believe is from the Lord to have a forum, a discussion where we can begin to deal with uh, uh, not just a specific area in perception, but really the overall uh, media perception of African American men and boys in particular. It, it seems like maybe I'm by myself, but every time you turn on the TV now, uh, African American boy or young man or, or older man is being victimized and is being portrayed. Uh, in the media uh, many times in very negative ways. Uh, and so today, uh, we come here to begin um, a dialogue about that, again, to lead hopefully to some, prayerfully to some real uh, solutions. Um, and we're here to discuss some of the recent events that have played out in our media, some of the ongoing issues in our community, and determine if we can begin not only just to talk about these things, but to stimulate some action in our community to stimulate others, you and I, to get involved perhaps at more significant levels, to find solutions to address some of these challenges and concerns in some real practical ways. Let me be very clear, because we do have representatives of the media here today on our panel. We are not here to bash the media, uh, the police, our law enforcement, or the judicial system. That's not what we're here to do. What we want to have is an open and honest discussion, uh, an open and honest dialogue uh, that, again, will hopefully lead to uh, some solutions to some of these things that are occurring in our community. Can we all say amen to that? Amen. Let me give you a few housekeeping details. Uh, when you entered, uh, you should have received some information about uh, how to participate uh, via text questions to us during this discussion. 
Um, and so if you're tech savvy, um, that'll be an opportunity for you to text questions to us uh, during the discussion. These questions will be reviewed and as time permits, addressed by our panelists. We may not get to all of your texts. We just want you to know that, but we will do our very best. This discussion is being live streamed literally all over the country. Um, and so uh, for those of you who are joining us via live stream, we ask you to please, if you're posing a question, if you're texting a question in uh, to us uh, for our live audience, please uh, keep your uh, cell phones on vibrate uh, and identify where you are if you are texting uh, a question to us from some other part of the country. Um, if you need to exit out of the sanctuary to go to the bathroom or if you have to leave, we want to let you know um, where the restrooms are. Um, the restrooms are uh, in the rear of the sanctuary uh, on either side. Ladies restroom is to my left, which would be your right to uh, immediately back here where the brother's holding up his hand. Our ladies restrooms are right back there, my left, your right. Our men's restrooms to my right, your left right back there where you see the brother holding up his hand. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for what you're doing. Um, at the conclusion of this discussion, we invite you to join us for light refreshments in the fellowship hall. The fellowship hall is to my left, your right, out these brown doors. You make a sharp left and it'll take you right into the fellowship hall. So at the conclusion of our time together, if you wanna stay, we would like to continue that dialogue over food. We'll be more than happy to meet with you in the fellowship hall to do that. At this time, I'd like to introduce our panel. Um, our panel is broken up into uh, essentially uh, three uh, life group, age group representations. We have our millennial panel here, uh, and our first panelist is Mr. DeAndre Barnes. He is the president of the Portsmouth City Sports Club and a legal legislative assistant with the U.S. House of Representatives. Our next millennial panel uh, panelist is Carlos Clanton. He is representing the National Urban League Young Professionals. We have uh, Mr. Derek Debro. He is uh, newly graduated from the Chesapeake Police Department. We have Mr. Isaiah Mariner. He is a senior at North Carolina A&T University. And we have Mr. Justice Rudy Seal, a junior at Deep Creek Middle School in Chesapeake. This is our millennial, pardon? High school, oh, I'm sorry, Deep Creek high school in Chesapeake. I said middle school. <laughs> if you were in middle school, we'd have a problem, Justice. Let's appreciate our panel. Let's put the hands together. Appreciate our panel. On the other side of the coin, uh, for our Baby Boomer slash Gen X panel, uh, we have brother Trevor Lucas. He is the co-producer and host of a progressive television show called The Vadio Show. We have Mr. Warren Harris, the City of Virginia Beach Director of Economic Development. We have Mr. Anton Bell, the City of Hampton's Commonwealth Attorney. We have Mr. Roger Chesley, an award-winning journalist and a writer for the Virginian Pilot newspaper. And finally, we have Mr. Carl Edmonds, Program Administrator, City of Portsmouth, Behavioral Health Care Services, Outpatient Treatment Services. If y'all stand up one more time together, please, let's appreciate our Gen X Baby Boomer panel. And certainly, lastly, and not leastly, um, we have our moderator for today, uh, and he is the senior pastor of our church, Dr. Melvin Mariner. Pastor, if you'll stand up, I'm sure everybody knows who you are, but. Our pastor will be moderating our discussion today, and so you'll see a lot of him. Um, we have today, uh, finally, I'll introduce our facilitator, and his name is Mr. Alonzo Parker. He'll pick things up at this point. Once again, I wanna thank you so much for coming. We are looking forward to what's going to happen here. Again, our goal is not to bash, but our goal is to discuss and come up with some real legitimate, spirit-led, God-given solutions. Thank you so much. Alonzo? There we go. I want to just say good morning again. Good morning. Good morning to our panel. Good morning to Dr. Mariner. Good morning to you all. We are so excited for you to come out. 
very quickly just to see how things are structured. What we're going to do is I'm going to actually present some questions and issues to Dr. Mariner. And he's actually going to pitch those to the panel. We're going to have four to five minutes, four to five minutes, four to five minutes for discussion. And while that is going on, what's going to happen is we have a screen that is right behind us. And once we get into the last minute or so, our screen will then turn yellow. Our screen will turn yellow. And then once everybody should stop talking, it's going to actually turn red. Amen. And so we say red, let's go ahead and start, stop talking and winding things down. So what we're going to do now is actually we want you all to be involved. We want to engage you all in what's going to happen. So what we're going to do is show you how you can pose questions and text while you're doing that. So if we could have the first slide there, if we could, we could throw it up of how we're actually going to do this. Now, if you have your cell phone, your smartphone, go ahead and take it on out. Go ahead and take it on out. I'm going to do it with you just to make sure everything is all right. So now, I'm pretty sure if a lot of you are familiar with texting. So what you're going to do is in your to field, in your to field, who the text goes to, it is 22333. And you're going to text beyond, the word beyond. So instead of your boo or my sweetheart, put the word beyond, beyond, B-E-Y-O-N-D. You all go ahead and do that. Send that to 22333. Now, once you send that first text, we're actually going to have our first question just to make sure that this is live and that we are streaming and everything. Oh, social media. Go ahead. Somebody's already logging in. So once you do that, pick A for word of mouth, B for social media, C for television, D radio, E email, F if you were just driving on by and saw a lot of people and just came on in. All right. So let's go ahead and see what we get here. So we have a lot of more people, word of mouth. So this is how it's going to work. So anytime during the event, you can actually send a question. So let's go to the next question if we could. How do you stay informed? So this is an open-ended question. So let's, a few words of how you stay informed. Is it, is it the media? Is it the newspaper? How do you stay informed? And we just want to show you how your responses are going to show up. So let's go ahead. See how that's going to work. So all of your responses are going to show, and it sounds like a lot more media. The larger words is a lot of media. A lot of media. So again, it's private. It's, it, whenever you do that, it's private. It's just actually going to go to our, our sisters over here. They're going to see your questions. So if we have time, we're going to get to those. So without further ado, we're actually going to go ahead and jump into things. Dr. Mariner, what we're actually going to do is the first thing that we're going to do is start, start in our discussion. And you can sit there or wherever you like, Dr. Mann. We're going to actually, this is a, we're going to pose to them, what three words would you use to describe yourself and your generation? We're going to pose that. What three words would you, how would you describe yourself and your generation? And if you could start, Dr. Mann, with the millennials, with this question, if you would. Those that know me know I don't like talking about myself, but I guess I have to today. Um, three things about me is that one is that I'm focused. Um, I see I see something going on in the community, and I keep it inside. 
sight and I go and I push for it and make it better. Another thing about me is that I'm dedicated. Whatever issue it be, whether it be community centers for the kids, um, providing something for the kids to have, positive that keeps them on the right track, I'm devoted to making sure that happens. Um, another thing is I'm community oriented. Everything I do is in the community. Whether it be with my organization, Portsmouth City Sports Club, we provide sports for kids. And it's really not about sports, it's more so about keeping them out of trouble so they have something positive to do. Growing up, I didn't have a lot of positive avenues, so I wanted to be that avenue for those kids. My brother kept me out of trouble, so I wanted to be the big brother for them. So those are three things that I would use to describe myself. As far as the other question, I know, um, the generation. To describe our generation. I think our generation is misunderstood. A lot of people um, think they know why our generation is not doing a lot of things, but they, they don't really come and talk to us to figure out why we're not. A lot of people say um, we're not voting, but the reality is that you're not giving us anybody to vote for. <laughs> um, we're unappreciative. When I, I sit in a, a room with people older than me, and they and they they kind of don't listen to my opinion. It's it's through my action when they start to listen to me. Um, and we're ready. I, I I see when when causes come up, the Michael Brown incident or what happened in um New York. You see people out there marching, you see people out there doing stuff, and what, what's happening now, we haven't seen in a long time. So I, I think we're ready. You, get, you give us a call, and, and, and you kind of fix some of the other things. I think we can really make a difference in the world. All right. Hey, Carlos, right before you go, Carlos. No problem. We want to be mindful of time. We said uh, we can keep it to three words. Oh, <laughs> words. We appreciate it. No, that was good. That was it said good. why, so. Yeah, no, no, I know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Carlos, if we keep it just uh, for the sake of time, because we have a lot of stuff to discuss. So three words to describe yourself and generation. I'm okay. glad you told that before me. <laughs> <laughs> you will um, set me up. <laughs> no, I, honestly, um, and at, when the question was posed, um, you know, and I, I kind of wore this T-shirt this morning. It's from my uh, Chicago uh, chapter, um, you know, and I, I just want to first of all want to quickly recognize all my young professionals out there from all over um, with the Urban League um, and bringing you greetings from the national um, board. But uh, young, black, and ambitious. Um, that's what I would say uh, the three words that would kind of describe myself. Um, you know, young, black, and ambitious. And when you say that last word, ambitious, um, it's, it kind of puts fear in some people. And we'll kind of talk about that later. All right. <clears throat> By myself um, again with the Chesapeake Police Department, and so I would say I'm passionate, open minded, and a life student. The passion is that you know I joined the department to try to help the community because I feel that in all the situations in which is uh, that we're going to discuss today, the police is involved. So we have more of, of us, you know, in the department, more of us, you know, being uh, helpful in the law enforcement aspect, we can maybe make a change. <clears throat> as far as the generation. I just say mainly that we're misunderstood and misguided. That a lot of things that we do, it seems that uh, just like the police, you know, it seems that some of our actions, or some of our uh, representatives, you know, some of the people that may be in certain communities represent all of us, and that's not what it is. You know, like us young guys up here now, we represent uh, just about a good percentage of the black youth, and we are not all criminals and out there. So that's kind of my. Three words to des describe myself. Uh, let's skip that one. Uh, three <laughs> words for my generation, though. Um, misunderstood, miseducated, and tired. Um, I would have to say three words would be repeated, um, rebellious, and real. That would be to describe myself and my generation. All right, I guess we moved on to the older folks. Uh, <laughs> if I would describe um, myself, I would first and foremost uh, call myself God guided. And uh, secondly, um, I call myself a visual activist. You know, we, instead of speaking, I, I'm more of an action oriented type of person um, and also ambitious. And like you said, I know what di direction you're going in. Um, an ambitious black man can be 
fearful to some. But um, in my position, an ambitious black man is better for the community. And um, when I think to describe our generation as a whole, you know, well, I guess I'm kind of in the middle here. Um, I, would, I would call us uh, battle-tested, strong, and leaders unknown. And I say leaders unknown because a lot of us don't know that there are millennials watching. So we are leaders unknown, and once we realize that, we'll take our position and uh, do our job in uplifting our community. Uh, good morning, Grove family. Uh, three words describe me. One, responsible. Uh, two, motivated. And if, and if you think ambitious scares them, what about being smart? And then in terms of describing the generation or the, uh, this generation, I would say that we were change agents. And because and as a result of being change agents, some of the benefits that we do have and enjoy today came as a result of that uh, willingness to, to step into the game and, and seek change. Good morning, Anton Bell. Uh, if I had to describe three words, the first one would probably be bold. I am the person who would probably say the things and speak the truth that most people would be afraid to say and would not be afraid of the faces and the reactions to whatever needs to be said. I will be the one that will pretty much um, expose the elephant in the room, so to speak. The second thing, um, I seek wisdom because in I wear multiple hats. I'm an ordained minister and I'm also a Commonwealth attorney for the city of Hampton, so as the chief law enforcement officer, I have to walk in wisdom every day. I cannot afford to make it, to make the wrong mistake at any time because you're dealing with lives and you're dealing with uh, bigger consequences and ramifications of any decision that you have to make. And then the third thing, which pretty much governs my life is um, I have the heart of a servant because I have, I, I grew up in a very, very poverty-stricken environment. And so I am extremely grateful. I should not be where I am today. I know that. I am the one that should be either locked up or dead. And literally, it is by the grace of God that I am where I am. And so I, I keep that always in the back of my head whenever I am interacting or doing anything because I recognize that someone, I had to stand on someone's shoulder to get where I am. Uh, to describe my generation, I would just say my generation is the generation of opportunity. I uh, am a generation X, born in the 70s, and so by that time, the civil rights movement had really knocked down a lot of barriers, and so I never spent one day in a segregated classroom. I am the generation that could take advantage of affirmative action. I went to school, North State University, NSU in the house, yes. <laughs> I went to uh, school on a full scholarship uh, because I learned the power of knowledge and I picked up a book and I applied it. I went to law school on a full scholarship because again, I picked up a book and I understood if I can go to undergrad on a full scholarship, hey, why not law school? And so um, I had a lot of opportunities and I know it was the result of the struggles of the baby boomers that my generation was able to accomplish what we have accomplished. Um, three words to describe myself, troubled. I, I see so many gains that we as a people have made and it seems like we're slipping backwards in so many areas. Uh, two, hopeful. Um, when I'm part of uh, forums like this and, and I see some of the protests that have arisen because of some of the recent uh, homicides of uh, black males and seeing it's not just black people coming out. It's, it's a mix of people that are saying something must change. I'm hopeful. And then lastly, uh, I'd like to see myself as an example um, that if you take a look at some of the things that have happened in my life and the way I was raised, uh, maybe this can be something for you to do as well. I'm going to pass on the generation because I'm going to speak for myself here. Okay. okay, three words that would describe me are committed, struggle, and eradicator. Uh, I use those words because I am a baby boomer. Uh, the struggle continues. I think as we make milestones in, in, in our communities, we forget sometimes that the struggles continues in, in, until there is a significant event. It continues continuously. 
I'm an eradicator because I work in treatment and I meet people that have multi-generational issues that have been ingrained hopelessness and, and factors that continue to contribute to that. My goal, what I work to do with people I meet in the community and treatment, I try to instill in them what I have experienced to help them and also uh, some of the things that uh, we can bring about to help create change. Uh, describing the baby boomers, I was thinking earlier, we grew up in a time that we watched cowboy movies, we saw Superfly, and those are the items and the things that influenced us and what we were. Uh, my life story, I like to share it sometimes with people because you see the finished product, but people don't always see the struggles and the things that happened to get to this point. And I like to take credit for people like uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Strong, who saw in me early in Washington Park that I could go to college and be something. We need more people like Dr. Strong and people that are on this panel today as well. Well, thank you. I, I really appreciate all the answers. Really do appreciate all the answers. Before we move on, I just want to remind, uh, we're streaming live, so if you have a question wherever you are, just text us where you are and your question and it go to our team. Uh, the next, Pastor, we, we're talking about the media. Uh, it seems like there's always a negative story about African Americans on television and in reports. In your opinion, in your opinion, Dr. Marin, if we uh, is the reporting balanced? And we have some some slides that we can have those where things are being reported. For instance, we have Crack Mayor died at 78, and on the same day we had Heath Ledger just died. But both of them were related to drugs. So are are things being Balance. And, and Dr. Marin, I think we, we have uh, Mr. Roger yeah. Chelsea here with the media, so we could possibly start with him on, on that. Could you address the caption, um, Crack Mayor dies at 78, versus what do we see Heath Ledger dead, and speak to uh, the reality that many people see, um, perhaps uh, a slant in how press covers certain issues, uh, especially in the black community? Um, I, I think you're always going to see, uh, you, you're always going to have problems with the way the coverage is if you don't have enough people of color that are in our newsrooms. And be, we have been radically reduced, especially uh, in newspapers and TV, everybody over the past few years, especially as uh, the internet has come forward and given more uh, there's been more battle for the revenue dollar, especially through advertising. So when you do not have enough people of color in your newsroom, you're going to get headlines like what you see on the left. And uh, you also, because certain stories are easier to cover, crime, uh, courts, then you often see a, a more of that in media outlets, especially on TV, and to a somewhat lesser extent in the, in the newspaper. Well, and, and looking at that, and, and we read the paper, we either online, uh, and we see articles, correct, Mayor. Tell me why is there such a slant? Honestly, why is there such a slant when it comes to um, Marion Barry versus Heath Ledger? Well, I, I, I believe the the crack mayor headlines from either the New York Post or the New York Daily News. And if you know a little bit about the tabloid nature of some New York newspapers, you'll, you'll get a sense of what they're often going for. I doubt seriously that would have been the headline in the Washington Post, for, an, for instance. Um, and I can't necessarily speak for all media outlets, nor can I necessarily speak for the pilot because I don't, I'm not the editor there. I have control over my column, but not over the other things that are in the paper. Um, some because it's insensitivity, you'll see some of the things that you're, you're mentioning. Um, and one of the ways to change that is instead of complaining about it personally, you have to you know, get some uh, feedback, you have to call the paper, you have to send letters to the editor, and you have to engage with the media outlets if you feel like they are not doing what they should be doing. Uh, in its coverage. We also have radio. Um, do you feel that radio is, is slanted in any way or 
it's based based upon, I guess, the uh, we're, we're person with the microphone. A, we're actually a television show. Okay. But um, I feel like uh, media is more powerful than a lot of us uh, pay attention to. Uh, when it comes to media, ever since they were saying I can dig it and wearing bell bottoms, we followed everything that we saw. Um, media tells you who you are, what's cool, what's not, um, what, who you should hang out with, uh, even what kind of drugs to use. Media is extremely important. And when I, I can't listen to the radio with my daughter in the car because of now the envelope has been pushed so far to where um, you're, you're more likely to hear about crack on the radio than you'd hear about being ambitious and starting your own business. Um, I, and I think that is um, because of the fact that just like a business owner, a business owner understands its customer and we market uh, uh, according to our customer base. So if you don't think for one minute that the media outlets don't understand the listener, you're crazy. And if you don't understand that they don't know how you react to what they put out, it's crazy. So they understand that we follow. If they didn't understand that, we wouldn't put certain clothes on certain entertainers to sell it. Or we wouldn't put um, certain people in a certain um, restaurant to sell their product. We, they understand that we not only follow the things that they put on, that they, but we also follow the, the attitude. And we also follow that personality. We, we here have a um, identity crisis due to the media. We aren't who God made us to be because we're too busy trying to follow these entertainers. So I feel like that the reason why it's being put there is to keep certain customers in position. That's my belief. And you know, it, and the reason why I believe that is because of over time seeing how the masses have shifted in the direction of media. Let me move to millennials. How do you feel as hearing these statements, do you feel that the media, uh, the paper, and television shows, uh, radio broadcasts, do you feel that they are to you uh, an unfair median uh, that perhaps may not be displaying uh, the totality of the millennial generation? I mean, how do you view media today? As another branch of the government. Say it a little louder. As another branch of the government, I see the media helping portray particular images that the government has been basically portraying for a long time now. I mean, the media just enforces basically a political agenda or the status quo, and not necessarily there to talk about what's true, but they're there to provide sensational stories that, like he said, are going to get a rise out of the public. And in that, in that fashion, it's, it's really just another way to control people, control their thoughts. So it's another branch of the government to me. Mm. I, so obviously it's not a fair portrayal. Anyone else? Millennials. I mean, I, I would agree with um, everything that's possibly been said, um, but I, when you see that, you know, you almost have to go back to say, well, why would you do it? And it goes back to dollars and cents. Everything is controlled by money. So at, you know, if it bleeds, it leads. Um, and in, in some respect, they're going to put that out there because it's going to sell. And like you were saying in the, um, you know, newspapers are uh, a dying breed right now. Um, and as far as the different mediums of uh, communication and how we get our information. Um, so you're constantly trying to one-up the other person. So the more outlandish or the, the more Jerry Springer type that you can kind of get out there um, is what people are going to pay attention to. And that's what, you know, individuals are looking for. Um, and so, you know, how do you excite me? You know, what, what's going to make me pick up that paper? What's going to make me spend that piece of money or subscribe to your um, particular piece of medium? So um, that's what I would say at this particular point. So when I look at that, um, I look at to the, you know, just short. If it, lead, if it bleeds, it leads. And um, that's what I'm going to spend my money on. And that's what they're placing out there in front, in front of us. All right. Any, any response? I mean, we just heard that media is a form of control. That's not necessarily a response, but uh, it's interesting because there is a belief that, and I'm of the generation that still loves the newspaper, and the newspaper asks questions as to why they're losing subscribers and why this generation is going to other sources to get, get their information. But traveling this week, I happened to pick up the New York Times, and um, 
you know, of course, their model is uh, all the news that's fit to print. And you, you just take out the sports section, of course, and you just go through it and look at the articles and the images of what and how they portray people of color. And then you go to the back page, and it's the glamorous white female. And so you kind of wonder, you know, is that an agenda? Is that un an uneducated editorial staff? Is that insensitivity because there isn't enough people of color in print or in the news? Or is it a really an objective that's trying to, to um, continue a, a perception to keep us uh, to think about ourselves in a certain manner? So it is a legitimate question. Roger, it's not the Virginia Pilot, so don't write about me now. <laughs> You're I've, going, had, I've you, had my turn on the paper. But. Right. Tuesday's column. Tuesday's <laughs> So moving on to uh, education, uh, I know this is near and dear to your heart, education. Education is said to open doors, open doors, but are our young men taking advantage of those doors, or do you believe there is a true disparity among our black men in particular, going back to education? So is education opening doors, are we taking advantage of those doors? Um, I was listening to, uh, what is it, I guess the, Minister Esquire, <laughs> Reverend Dr. Esquire, um, and, and you spoke a book, book, book. Um, I think, and listening to the generation that we have out here now, uh, perhaps they view education, formal education in a different way. And, and I've heard that not only we stress in the millennial and the um, baby boomer generation, we stress formal education while they are stressing now that not only is formal education important, but the informal education that you learn other places must also be incorporated. But you don't hear us and the baby boomers talking about informal education. Um, and I heard, I think everyone's heard, and you said you picked up a book, you picked up a book, and you picked up a book, and that is part of the reason why you are where you are. Can we speak of the disparities in education? Well, one of the things that I, I see, I, I go to a lot of the um, schools in, in Hampton, and I just look at some of the areas uh, where some of these schools are, and you can see the disparity based on the neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. And so some schools obviously have more resources based upon the, the economic environment or community that they're located and then other schools obviously are struggling and when you listen to the news and and look at certain city budgets you're constantly hearing how school budgets are being cut and so you have to look at the priority and the message that it is being sent to the children because if you give me a new book versus giving me a bruised and abused book I'm going to look at education in a different manner than that person with that brand new book. Just like if you give me a brand new uh, shirt versus giving me a hand-me-down, I am going to view it differently. Um, as for me, um, education was a necessity. My mom was crazy. She was not playing. And the reason I picked up a book is because I couldn't watch TV Monday through Thursday. Now you're quiet. <laughs> but I couldn't watch TV Monday through Thursday because Monday through Thursday, I had to focus on school. And as a result of that, I got the grades that represented the focus that was the priority in my household. However, when I look at the generation now, I, I, I see a, a sense or attitude of I'm here because I'm forced to be here, but I don't necessarily look at it as is my opportunity or is my way out. I knew education was my way out of the hood. I had no other avenues. I used it as my avenue. My mom bought us a set of encyclopedias, and I know I'm dating myself a little bit, but she bought us, y'all remember those encyclopedias? Okay. <laughs> and, and she purchased those things, and I would pick up a, uh, an encyclopedia volume, and I would just read about the Civil Rights Movement. I would just read about 
the state of Montana or the, the state of New York and different things like that. And I know it seems kind of crazy, it seems kind of nerdy, but now I look at where I am and I'm glad I picked up that encyclopedia and, and, and was interested in learning. I had a thirst for knowledge. I don't see that thirst anymore. I, 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 what I see now is just children being moved along in the system. And if you are a problem, I'm gonna label you as special education or learning disability or behavior child. And how many of you know that if you cannot read by the, uh, the third grade, if you cannot pass that third grade test, they literally build jails to house that person. So, it's either education or incarceration. But you have to expose it because, and, and I put the, and I put the emphasis on parents knowing this, not on the child, because the parents are here to parent. And so you have to have parents who understand, if my child can't read, he's gonna be placed in a statistic that says a prison is gonna be built or a bed is gonna be made available when he gets 18, or nowadays when he gets 14, 15, and 16. Can you speak? Yes. <laughs> Feel free. Feel free. Uh, keep us on track, Alonzo. Alonzo, keep us on track. Feel free. Um, uh, there oh. is a disparity. Some of the dis disparity we create ourselves. Uh, as a baby boomer, we grew up in a period of time that teachers uh, were more nurturing. For me, that was an escape sometime going to school because it meant that uh, you were gonna make it a meal. You know, sometimes the struggles at home made it difficult sometimes to get everything you needed. Your parents did the best that they can. And we're in positions sometimes uh, when kids act out in the classroom, we're strict to give them a label as uh, uh, Brother Bill just mentioned is that we want to call it conduct disorder. You know, this kid is not incapable. Um, I was a kid in, in, in elementary school um, that, um, that sort of, I was quiet. I didn't talk uh, because none of the kids wanted to play with me because I smelled like kerosene. I had to go get kerosene so my mom can cook in the mor morning on the stove. So they told my mother, he has a learning disability. He can't speak, he can't learn. Uh, but thankful for there are were some teachers that saw the capabilities, not from the fact that I was not speaking, but the fact that I could learn concepts rather well, analytical stuff. I was, so it's that kind of nurturance that help us. And we're in the positions that we, we don't, uh, when we get in positions of power, we don't always do what we can to support the education system. There are politicians a lot that run on education, but they don't support education by funding education completely. Mm -hmm. So the disparity, uh, we create some of it, and there are still some, um, some uh, we, somebody mentioned it this morning, there's still uh, some race conscious attitude that older people have in working with black youth. Um, I just want to bring up this point because somebody brought it up last night uh, at the barbershop, actually. Uh, do you can get your best place. discussions in the barbershop. <laughs> so no, so I, I just want to <laughs> say that um, uh, one of the young men asked me, said, Mr. Edmonds, my son is having problems in school. What should I do? I said, well, you need to discipline him more. But he said, I can't beat him. But I said, there's other ways to discipline than, than a spanking. So I said, just take things away from him because you give him too much sometimes. But the other part of it is that because of that behavior, that kid might be labeled later on as conduct disorder and not suitable for the classroom and put in a special learning class. But the kid has potential and we have to stop judging and labeling people and creating our own disparities among ourselves. Before, before, we, move, before we move on, I wanna hear from millennials. Um, how do you feel about I mean, formal education and what it's doing now and the way, where the system currently is um, and what you're hearing from parents, um, whether years ago or currently, I know that we have uh, Rudisil who's, who's in high school, so I'm not, you know, you speak on the high school level as far as how you view formal education, how you view formal or versus informal. I want to kind of delineate between formal and informal because there are more levels than just educating our minds. Um, from a standpoint of a junior in high school, 
I would have to say high school is like a trash bucket because first of all, like anytime you have a leader in high school, he is ostracized by the majority of people who are trying to be like each other, especially in the African-American community. I go to Deep Creek High School, it's full of black folk, and they all look like each other. They all want to be each other. They all talk like each other. They all act like each other. They do the same thing. They all in this big old group in the, in the hallway, and they yell, they scream. And then when somebody walks by and tells them, hey, go to class, they look at the they look at the person trying to get them into the classroom to get their education as they're doing the wrong thing, as they're on my back, as they, they won't leave me alone, they all on me. Um, I look at it as they somewhat have your best interest in mind. I won't say that everybody in the school has your best interest, but most of the time the security and about 50% of the teachers, they will have your best interest in mind. And when they see the majority of the black people, they just cut them off because they know, the black people, they know that it doesn't, it doesn't matter. You understand? And you don't have the, the, the leadership that is needed. And they, they just, they just, they just don't, they don't recognize the leaders because the majority wants to stay as the majority. And that's pretty much it. Thank you, man. Anyone else? Yeah. Um, He's going to take, take over in a minute. Yeah, I'm, I'm going <laughs> to. Uh, speaking as, a, uh, as an administrator, um, I, I'm with Norfolk Public Schools and the uh, Central Administration. Um, it, going back to the, the cycle, um, and you know, when we look at informal and formal education, I, and I see kids who come into school, sometimes when they come into a school building, that's sometimes the only structured environment that they have. I mean, a lot of our kids have some serious, um, you know, issues. They have some serious situations where they're having to step up and they're having to become a lot, uh, take on a lot more responsibility than what they used to have to do um, in order to make sure that they had, um, you know, they have a roof or that they're, you know, and a lot of times we have a lot of kids, even in Norfolk, um, we've got over 500 some kids who are classified as homeless. So you think about those struggles when you come in there and then you want me to learn and sit in the classroom and behave and, 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 and think. Um, you know, so there's a lot of those type of things that you put there when you talk about this cycle. You know, we had a, um, you know, an unnamed governor that I won't um, mention at this particular point who cut funding for um, early childhood education in this state. You know, if you want to get to a child, it, you know, all the studies show that you put funding in early childhood education, that that child who has funding at that early, you know, that, that, that out of the womb up to four years old has a better chance of being successful. And where do you need to put more money at other than in our diverse, poor neighborhoods? And so we had a governor who came in here, took funding out, and so then we had more things, we, you know, and, and I don't want to get on the SOLs, you know. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so you don't put funding, you don't support the early childhood education. Now, I'm glad that we do have a, a grant, you know, a federal grant that we we have a governor now who wants to take that money back um, to be able to support. But you've got kids who now who get into, you know, like you said, third grade. If you can't read by third grade, we're making prisons. And then, you know, in Virginia, you know, that's an industry, you know. And, 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 in Virginia. And, no, but, but Virginia's one of the worst. But if you look at it, and you look at that, in that respect, that now you get a misdemeanor or a, you know, which is just a barrier crime to a felony. And so now you get a felony, now you're paid for the rest of your life. And so now it's hard to get a job. It's hard to do any of these other things. It's a cycle. And so, you know, and I see this on a consistent basis. And so, you know, when we talk about informal and formal education, this is where I constantly, you know, my job is community engagement. The community has to step up. The community has to be more engaged in our schools. The community has to take, take back and, you know, and say, hey, you know, we're not. I'm going to I'm going to right here. So we have a lot to cover. Pastor, we want to talk about Moving on, we were talking about money and funding. Why are there not more entrepreneurs? And what is the major barrier for entrepreneurship? Why aren't there any more entrepreneurs? We have a lot of entrepreneurs. We have drug dealers as entrepreneurs. Dope, man. <laughs> <laughs> That's how they view life. Mm -hmm. um, and so let's speak more. Um, and I, I, I really, let me just say this. I really wanted, I, I couldn't find a person to accept it. I wanted to find a panelist um, who was a gangbanger, a 
a person who says, I have no need of education, uh, and that's why I dropped out, to give us their side of the story. And no one could take me up or would take me up on that. Um, and so let's look at entrepreneurship, uh, because in the 60s, I know all of y'all are too young to even know about the 60s, but in the 60s, we had a lot more minority uh, entrepreneurship than we have in 2014. Um, but I, I see a shift in, in the millennial generation, more of them want to be entrepreneurs. Um, and so let's talk about where you all are as it relates to why aren't there many more entrepreneurs. Now we have most of our young folk who don't want to work for anybody, <laughs> who want to be entrepreneurs. Let's speak on that issue. Can I start with the baby, baby boomers first? Um, I mean, really, let's go on, on the area of entrepreneurship. Can everybody be an entrepreneur? Well, um, I'll speak on, since we talked about education, it seems as if um, even your most well-educated black person um, in America today, uh, that the school system is now designed differently was, you know, in the early 1900s. The school system is now designed to uh, train you to work in the system that's, that's out there. It's not designed to train you to be a free thinker, to create. So, I'm not saying that school isn't necessary, but I think that uh, parents, leaders, that we need to step up and be an example and show our children the hustle side of things. Because it's good to be smart, you have to be smart, but I know people who will hustle, out hustle a college student any day. Because Google, and there's a lot of information that you can use to start your own business that you don't need a classroom. I'm not saying classroom isn't important, but if you apply yourself and actually put in the work that you can start your own business, but school, schooling isn't designed to teach us to be free thinkers. We have to, as leaders, get our kids together and teach them about starting, you know, their own businesses. And they need to see more of us doing it. Um, we have to, we can only go as far as we can see. So if I don't have a visual example of what that looks like, then I just figure, you know, I just follow what I, I've already seen, which is go to school and get a good job, which, which isn't bad, but, um, you know, we need our own businesses. It's, it's time to stop having other ethnicities come in and open up stores selling us things that they don't use. Black and Miles do-rags and gold teeth. And we buy it up. But we won't open up our own store. We have to be an example. That's an awesome segue. That's an awesome segue. Dr. Murray, you just talked about that, our own businesses. And Nielsen reports that African American buying power is $1.1 mm -hmm. trillion dollars, talking about what we're spending our consumers. Mm -hmm. So they describe the black population as young, hip, highly influential, and say that we are growing 64% faster than the general market, just our consumption. And this given, why, 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 why do we invest so heavily in things such as clothes, shoes, cars, and other things that do not appreciate? Why aren't we investing in our, in our future? We, we, you know, Dr. Mary, you see this on the screen here. You'll see this right down the street, and they mm -hmm. may not mm -hmm. pull up to a home. I got no time for that. Thank you. I got no time well, for Your that. thoughts, Dr. Mary? You know, let's get into some deep conversation. I think that, you know, as time is moving. Um, I, I want to go to Mr. 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 Harris. He, he's kept speaking about being smart. Um, and you're saying smart. We don't emphasize being smart. Um, would you say that we aren't smart, this generation isn't smart because they don't have more entrepreneurs? What, what happened? Uh, I mean, are we more concerned with the pimped out ride? And believe me, most guys don't ride in this, they ride in BMWs and Mercedes and you know, nice cars, not pimped out like we had in the 60s. I'm leaning, you know, and, and all those things. Um, but, but speak on the issue. Well, of let me try to try to first bridge the gap. I don't think s smart necessarily translates into being an entrepreneur. And is this younger, new generation smarter than we are? Absolutely. I mean, they are far well advanced in doing and dealing with life challenges 
and also with technology in ways in which this generation has never experienced. I think the challenge, uh, the question is, can anyone be an entrepreneur? And the answer is no. Uh, the second challenge is that uh, you have to understand that not every idea is a good idea. <laughs> and then the third is that you have to establish a business plan. And the biggest challenge in becoming an entrepreneur, that those that are entrepreneurs know, is the access to capital. And you have to place the capital into the business. You have to uh, not place it into the material things until you stabilize the company. And it's that discipline that's going to see it through that you're going to have to have in order to ultimately become a successful entrepreneur. But you know, to the question as to you know, smart and, and, and entrepreneurship, I don't think you necessarily have to be um, smart. You have to maybe be lucky. You also have to carve out a niche that no one has necessarily uh, uh, established themselves in. And you also have to have uh, perseverance in terms of doing the right things and understanding the process in which to advance your idea into a uh, enterprise that makes sense for the consumer and for you as a uh, as a business owner. Okay, anyone else? I mean, just. Uh, I have a daughter um, who attended UVA, got a degree in chemical engineering. She can work any place, uh, but she wants to start her own business. Um, and one of the things that she tells me all the time that my generation, we're not risk takers, that we're very traditional. You find a job and you stay on it all till you retire. Hmm. See, and that's the difference uh, with the new generation. They will change jobs every year if they so desire until they achieve their ultimate goal. Uh, and I think we have to start as parents, we have to start educating our kids early and investing them to, with them with stocks and bonds because uh, uh, she had an eye opener at UVA that most of the kids were already more prepared than she was when she got there. So the struggle, and I keep using that word struggle, the struggle continues and we have to perpetuate that and we have to encourage that early for our young people and invest in them when they do open a business. We have to support them when they do do that. Cool. Listening to that, um, I just got an email. Why do blacks usually destroy their own businesses and protests? Um, mm. and, and we'll come to that, that as well. Why do, why, does, why do we as black people destroy our own businesses? And I guess I'm speaking of the Ferguson situation uh, in which they burned down a lot of you know, struggling black businesses as well. I want to go back to a comment. We'll address that. The comment uh, was made that not all of you can be entrepreneurs. I'm not just speaking to this table, but not all of you. How do you how do you address that issue? Not all of you can be entrepreneurs, um, and perhaps um, looking at your parents or those who were adult influences in your life, do you see yourself being more than a risk taker than they were? Uh, speak to that because most of us want to tell you go to school, get a job, and get married. <laughs> <laughs> stay on a stay on a job for thirty years, even though you're unhappy, right? Unfulfilled. Speak on those areas, if you would. First and foremost, I would like to say that I have no time for that foolishness. <laughs> Second, um, of course, everybody can't be entrepreneurs. If everybody was an entrepreneur, nobody would be working for these entrepreneurs, and then everybody's business would fail. Yeah. So obviously, there's no way for everybody to be an entrepreneur. Somebody has to be working for somebody. Essentially, everybody needs help. A leader is nothing without the people that follow them. Because who are they leading? Just themselves? Then they're just a lone wolf. It's not really a leader. They're just solo dolo in the world. For anything to work, you need people to support you. So therefore, the entrepreneurs need people who are willing to go and support them. And that's why you have people who have no interest at all in being entrepreneurs. Because there are a lot of people who feel like that's too much work in the first place. They don't have any desire. Most people are just content going to work, getting that paycheck, you know, that imaginary money to go and buy the things that they need, and so on and so forth. And the cycle for them continues. And then there are other people who just don't have any desire to lead at all. So, no, everybody's not going to be an entrepreneur. Are y'all risk takers, more so than the former generation, millennials? That's relative. Hmm? That's, re that's relative. I mean, okay. that's relative to who it is you're talking about and who it is you're comparing it to in the past. Because 
quite obviously there were some very, very, very good risk takers that were here before our generation came in. Yeah. And we see that because there are a lot of major corporations that sprung up out of nothing. They sprung up from, you know, little things. You got McDonald's that was started by two brothers in a small shack that was bought out by somebody. And that person, Ray Kroc, when he bought McDonald's from them, that was a risk that he was taking. He wasn't entirely sure if that business was going to be successful everywhere else. Now, granted, it turned out to be, but that was a risk he had to take. And now, nowadays, there's just a different set of risks that people are going to have to take. And it's hard to weigh that because not enough time has necessarily transpired okay. for us to see how those risks that they've taken have played out. I mean, the consequences haven't fully fulfilled themselves yet. That's good. That is good. That's good. We're going to pivot now. We're going to pivot. How many fathers do we have in the room? Just raise your hand by showing how many fathers. Fathers. Wow. Wow. Fathers. 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 I'm a father in the future. How many fathers? I'm sorry. Fathers. I thought you said fathers, man. I thought you said fathers. Yo, you almost had a heart attack, my G. about that. You ain't You ain't got no grandkids, man. Okay, go ahead. I misunderstood the question. <laughs> that was going to be another oh. panel right there. That was a whole You almost got in trouble, bro. I was <laughs> the reason it went. <laughs> wow. Okay. <laughs> wow. Okay. As fathers, Dr. Mernon, as fathers or future fathers, do you feel that there is necessarily a reason to inform your sons of prejudices that exist? Or do you believe we live in a post racial society where race plays little? Or no effect it's on the, the day to day life. Hmm. That race plays no effect. Say that again. That race plays little or no role in how you are defined, perceived, or even accepted. That race is not even a factor. Do you feel that race is a factor? Yes, I feel race is a factor. Um, I have a 14. Yes, um, I have. I have children, so I think it's, it's, it's important that we inform not only our sons, but our daughters as well. When I see things on the TV, I take my son and my daughter and I sit in front of the TV and explain to them what's going on. And, and I let them know the, the backstory of it. Also, um, as, as far as race being important in 2014, it is because I know, I know that it's coming up, but we talk so often about black on black crime. And really, in my opinion, it, it's no such thing as black on black crime. Because black people, the, the reason people kill those in their, in their neighborhood more than the others is because they're around them more. Just like if you was your brother and sister, you're gonna fight more than you would fight with somebody outside of your house. So it's the same thing, we're in the same communities. So we're more likely to get in an argument and do things against those who look like us than the other color. That the reality is in 2011, I believe, whites kill more white people mm -hmm. than, than black. But you don't hear about that. All you hear about is black on black crime. When, for instance, it, Tam Tamar Rice, when you talk about um, racial issues again, Tamar Rice got kids 12 years old, just got killed for playing with a toy. But you got this guy who shoots up a movie theater. The, the, the police didn't shoot him, he walked out. <laughs> He walked out, and, he, and, he, and he's, get, he's getting his time in court. You're getting ahead of us, Barnes. You're getting ahead of us. I know. Yeah, we, we, we're going to touch on that. We are. We're going to touch on that. We are. We're going to touch on that. You know, I, yeah. and, and, uh, and I jump in this one. I mean, I'm not a father, but I'm a, a proud uncle. I mean, I, I, you know, I'm there involved in my Takes nephew's village. lives. But I will just jump this in here that, um, you know, I was thinking about that this morning, that we are suffering from what I call the Obama effect. You know, we, you know, for a lot of us, you know, we never thought we'd have a black president. And if you look at it from 2008, 2012, systematically we've watched gains that we've made in, um, in civil rights and our rights um, and, and progress erode, you know, and literally being taken away from us. Um, and so when we talk about race relations, you know, it's like, well, you got a black president, so we don't have a race issue in this country anymore. You know, so affirmative action, got, you know, we, there's no need for affirmative action. You know, you know, you've got a black president, you know, we don't really need the Voting Rights Act anymore. Your, your, your right to vote doesn't need to be protected. You know, but when we started to see things that happened in Ferguson, we started to see things in New York, you know, with Mike Garner, it began to become a you know, wake-up call that, hey, 
no, th there are some racial issues in here and everybody isn't on your side and that we still have a long way to go. But you know, I, I'd say that we are really in this thing right now, so what do we do after Obama? You know, when he leaves out of office, you know, there, there's some real serious things in here that we need to address. Dr. Mayor, right before we, yes, thank you. I'm actually gonna queue up a video, Dr. Mayor, and then if, you, if we could queue the video and then we'll have more discussion, if you could uh, watch the screen here and uh, see how this plays out and we'll discuss this. he was pulled over. Uh, he was told to, uh, as we often are by, by our law enforcement officers <laughs> who are sworn in to, to serve and protect, and we honor them for their service uh, and their sacrifice to our community. And uh, he was asked to pull over, asked to um, offer his license and registration. He reached in. He, he thought that he was reaching for a gun. Uh, subsequently, he was shot. I'm not sure how many shots that went out, five or six. I won't even deal with why he missed as a police officer. <laughs> uh, uh, I mean, I'm not sure if I want you in the force if you can't hit the, up that close. Um, and so he was hit and he was asked why. So how do we address our black men? Uh, are our black men uh, more, endangered, more endangered now than they were in the 70s, in the 60s? Yeah, that's for anybody. I'll start with um, you. Speak first. You go first, Derek. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, <clears throat> first, we've got to educate each other on the policies and procedures, the mm -hmm. law, for the most matter. And uh, if we know the law, then we know what not to do and what to do. In circumstances like the video, um, and with any job, there comes you know responsibility to do the right thing and the wrong thing. Whether you're a Burger King making the fries, or you take the fries out too early, you know everyone makes mistakes. So you know it's all officers accountable for the wrong things done by some, that wouldn't be fair. So, and also in the academy, we've seen that video many times and we discussed the video and we, you know, we realized that that video was, uh, the officer was wrong, I mean, the officer was wrong. He told the guy to go in the car and get his ID. The guy went in the car to get his ID and then he started shooting him. You know, that was wrong. But in most of the cases that's uh, brought, it's gonna be brought up today and brought up a little bit later, the officer made a split decision you know, I made a split second decision and you have to be accountable for that decision and we have to understand that in those split second decisions, you know, our thought process, or I know my thought process is to, you know, save the community, you know, do what's best for the community. What's he doing in that video? I mean, that's a, you know, pretty bad example of that, but, you know, in that, in that particular video, I mean, the officer, it's not my um, position to say if he was right or wrong, but I just feel that he was wrong and, uh, you know, you just can't hold all officers accountable for the actions that some do. I, I think we have to teach our young people that when you bump up against police, when you're stopped, obey the police officer for then. Even if you don't like the situation, even if you think there's something wrong, I don't think you're going to get justice on the street. If you have problems, get the officer's name and badge number. 
um, find out what you're being stopped for, but I want people to survive these encounters. And um, as probably a lot of you know, I appear with uh, Barbara Ham Lee on her show, Another View, once a month on the round table session. We had a, another airing yesterday, and she played a clip, a clip from a, a researcher by the name of Constance Rice, who had interviewed over uh, 900 uh, police officers over an 18-month period. And some of the white police officers she talked to said, I am scared of black people. Uh -huh. Now, you might think that that's irrational and you might think that that's not fair, but given that you know some police officers are going to react that way, and given that you know you want to get home to your wife and your children and your families every day, I think we need to understand that some of that fear, while maybe irrational, is there. And we also know that police officers, for the most part, very rarely are they A, charged, or B, convicted in these types of incidents. So, you know, a lot of times they might be held responsible in civil court, but not in criminal court. So I think the main thing is, what do we teach our families, and especially our young black men, to get through these situations without being harmed? Because we also have something that was actually submitted by Dr. Boyce Watkins, mm -hmm. and it gives highlights of how to interact with police. And I'm not going to read them all, mm -hmm. but it's be respectful. I heard you say that. Mm -hmm. Be respectful. Don't speak first. Don't speak with hostility. Uh, just ask for permission. Don't make any sudden moves mm -hmm. when dealing with the police. So these things are, we're going to have them on our website. We're going to have them on our Facebook page. We can go to those. Uh, but we want to move on. We want to move on. Can, can I just say one thing Go real, real yes, quick? Uh, five of the local police chiefs had a, a session um, in Chesapeake last month, it was within the last six weeks or so, about how to survive a police encounter. And one of the things that they said is, understand also that the police officers, they're trying to do a job, and if you resist, then that sometimes that's going to escalate the situation. You want to de-escalate the situation as much as possible. Yeah, I want to add, too, that um, that video is a classic example of an emotion, fear versus fear. Mm -hmm. I have fear that you're going to do harm to me, and I have fear that you're going to do harm. So fear, when, when they meet at the same time, you're going to have a reaction like that. Cultural sensitivity is very significant, and I think that for, uh, and I know they do that in a lot of jobs. They do it with therapists, so we can learn how to deal with different people, with different beliefs, different customs. But when fear versus fear, um, you're going to have a, uh, a major tragedy that might occur, occur when that happens. Fear is a good emotion sometimes because it keeps you from going in the wrong place, but fear, and you're looking at my black face, mm -hmm. and I'm looking at your white face, <laughs> that can be a dangerous situation sometimes. So, so, in, so in essence, white folks get a black folk, get a black, some white folks get a black man. Um, I think it's more cultural sensitivity. I just think you need to know more about me sometimes. There you go. And, I, you know, that's where the, the, the breakdown is. You change your clothes, walk in uh, Lincoln Park or go someplace, you're going to be treated a lot different than Reverend Myrna or Old Myrna. So they judge us by how we look, and be, because of the way we look, it doesn't mean our intellect and who we are, it doesn't define us. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's more to us than what you see. Uh, going back to the newspaper articles and all those kinds of things. That, those are kinds of things that people that read the papers and, and look at the news, the news going to sensationalize everything sometimes. They want to sell papers. They want to do this. All the facts and all the stories aren't there on the background of individuals. So fear versus fear. That's the point I wanted to make. I hear what you're saying, but sometimes I can look like this and go into a department store and get yeah. followed. Okay. Right. I don't quite understand that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to jump in here. Uh, we, we need to talk about a few things. We're gonna, I, I, I know, I know. No, no, he's ahead. on manuscript. Yeah. I'm trying to fill them. That's why he's here, because he's going to keep me on task. <laughs> you know, and I know we won't cover all of them. And, and, and so this issue, how do you all feel? Do you feel <clears> that <throat> you need to change the way you, you look, you dress, in order for others to feel safe? No. No. God, no. No. God, no. I don't need no. I mean, granted, I understand that sometimes the way that you present yourselves is important, mm -hmm. and I'm not saying that you should try and present yourself in a more negative light, but at the same time,
same time, regardless of how it is that you may feel about yourself, other people are already going to have, and then when they see you, they're automatically going to make up their mind already, regardless of whether or not they know anything about you. Like he just said, you go in a department store and he could be dressed nicely and they still follow him around because they still feel like he might steal something. But he probably might have gone in there with more money than every other person that's exactly. in that store. But they Typically, I do. Exactly. <laughs> Typically, so, I so do. So I feel like a, across across the board, there's a there's a more a larger cultural issue, and not just a black culture, but I mean uh, American cultural mm -hmm. issue. And that's that this whole entire country is built on violence and excessive violence. Yes. And I mean, this country was acquired through mass genocide. The Native mm -hmm. American population was obliterated mm -hmm. for this country to be formed in the first place. But these are the types of things that people don't talk about. They don't talk about this country's historical violence and the fact that this country has consistently been violent. We, that, that's unheard of. So basically, what it really comes down to is that people need to start to value the lives of other people, and not just not just human life, but people don't have any type of concept of life in general. Mm -hmm. There's there's no type of reverence, there's no type of respect or anything for the life that this planet has. I mean, everything is going wrong in this country. We've been fracking, and now people's water is flammable. You cannot drink that. You can't even boil that to get good water out. Right. You're boiling oil at that point. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you, you, you talk, you brought it up, right? You brought it up. It's like we're sitting, we're sitting at, the, we're sitting at these tables and we're dancing we around the bigger issue. Talk about we're, we're, we're dancing around the bigger issue. All of these problems that we've been talking about could be right. solved if people learn to value the life of other people around them, regardless Sorry. of what they look like. Sorry. We wouldn't be having this, we wouldn't be talking about any of this. Right. Any of this. So we're look, we're looking at the absence from. of God. I'm going to stop right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're going to come back to you. We're going to come back to you. We can keep moving. No, no, no you're good. You, you, you are fine. You are fine. Um, yeah, going back to what he said, he okay. said, I need to hear from Bell that there is no such thing as black on black crime. I wanted to talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I need, in fact, I kind of wanted to talk about a couple of things that were said in reference to um, there are some myths. There is such thing as black on black crime because here's the reality. All black crimes are not committed in black communities. All black crimes are not committed within a certain location because of um, you have a lot of drive-bys that take place where people, I, I, I'll give you a case in point. I'm prosecuting a case right now where the individual too lured the person from their home in one city brought them to a very uh, private area in a wooded area in another city for the purpose of purchasing a gun and they executed him. And all of these individuals are 18, 19, 20 years old. And the main person who was responsible for executing this person was doing so because his juvenile brother was being charged and prosecuted in another city for murdering someone else. And he thought this individual was going to testify against his brother. So he executed him. I personally prosecuted that little brother when he was 13 years old for shooting two sailors who would not give up their money when they tried to rob them. And because he got mad at them, he shot them at age 13 and it was two o'clock in the morning. Where was his mother? I already know where his father was because he's locked up. But where was his mother? And so when you talk about black on black crime, I, 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 I'm sorry, I talk from, it, from a very personal perspective. See, when a murder takes place, I get the call and I have to go out to the crime scene and look at a dead body. Just like New Year's Eve, there was a 16 year old who because he likes to steal bikes and these two individuals did not like the fact that he was stealing their bike.
and they got into a verbal altercation, he decided to break into his own home. Mind you, he didn't have a key to his own home at age 16 because his parents already knew what he was like. And he came up on them with a shotgun and he executed them in front of 20 to 25 other young kids in a park. Not in his neighborhood, <coughs> but in a park. And they all were black. He's 16. They're 19 and 20 respectively. And now he's charged with two counts of capital murder at age 16 because he was angry. See, we have a rage issue in the African-American race that we need to address among our males. They are angry. This same boy, after he killed these individuals, carjacked another lady down the street to take her car. And he led the police on a city-wide chase and crashed the car at the VA in Hampton. And that's the only reason the car stopped. Wow. We have a major issue. 90 some percent of the murders that were committed in Hampton last year were committed by African Americans against other African Americans. I can only name one off the top of my head that was committed by a white American. One. One. And so we do have a major issue, and the problem that I have sometimes, and, and I see some of my young uh, professionals over here who was with me on Monday, the problem I have is when you begin to address the issue of black-on-black -black crime, typically that's the elephant in the room that we don't want to discuss, and people get mad in our community because we said, wow, we airing our dirty laundry in the public. But if you don't address that issue, it can be your son that's next. Right, understood, yeah. Hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up, hold um, up. You really didn't say not, nothing different. Uh, again, what I said was we tend to kill ourselves more because we're in the same community with them more. You, you express in, um, instances where somebody took somebody out of the community to do it. I think also it's important that um, we got to understand why it leads to that point. Because when somebody gets shot today, it ain't because the problem started today, it's because the problem started when they was younger. We're not providing them opportunities. I, I can talk about my childhood growing up, out Dale's home. When I, when I grew up, we had a basketball court out Dale's home. One day we came home from school, they took the basketball court because they told me they were shooting dice on us. They took the basketball court. Them same kids that used to be on the court every day started selling drugs. Once they started selling drugs, the money started looking good. And they started dropping out of school. Once they started dropping out of school, they started getting in trouble. I'm gonna have to hop in. I'm gonna hop in. Yeah, I, we wanna we wanna talk about a few more issues. I understand. That. Yeah. Um, one, and we are man, we're running. Oh, Doctor Brandon. Uh, time, time, time. <laughs> get away from us. Okay. So we want to talk about Ferguson, Doctor Brandon. We do. We want to talk about Ferguson. Uh, there have been several high, high profile deaths of African American men at the hand of police officers uh, in Florida. Also know about the case of George Zimmerman, the right to stand his ground, and the case of Trayvon Martin, and two different grand juries, and the Michael Brown, and now the Eric Garner cases have refused to indict, refused to indict either the officers, and have basically deemed their killings justified, and we all know about that. So protests, they have erupted across the nation. Um, again, African Americans, whites, everyone is protesting. Dr. Brandon, what we want to discuss now is, why is it of late? Why is it of late that we're hearing and seeing so much about police brutality and the shootings of African-American males? It seems that it has been going on for years. What has brought it to a war? Time is moving. Um, and I, 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 I don't want to just hit all of these issues and not walk out of here at least with one step. Uh, and so, you get the sheet. We can't cover everything on that sheet. Right. Um, but we have to make sure that we walk out of here with one positive step that we're going to take. Um, Mr. Bell, you spoke of rage. Uh, you spoke of this out of control 
mindset. Uh, we bring up Ferguson. Uh, we bring up Ohio. We bring up New York. Uh, we bring up Florida. We bring up and we lift perhaps four or five, um, four or five African American males who were basically taken out by a white police officer. Do you all feel that that's where our major emphasis should be? Or should our major, and, and this is a tight question, this is a difficult question, because we've got all of these four or five cases, um, and the whole country and the media is talking about these four or five cases where black men seem to be unjustly punished or murdered, and they were classified as homicides. Are, are we lifting up just these five and missing the larger picture of rage in the lives of our communities and the media is lifting these five that we would never address the real issues that black America must face? I'm, I'm, I'm just asking because we can go through the list of things, mm -hmm. but where are we? And we, um, we got to deal with the five issues that are nationwide, that are global now, but are we really missing what's going on in the black community? Many years ago, I'm not talking about what, what Bill Cosby is now, but Bill Cosby, Bill Cosby's statement some years ago, uh, Michael Eric Dyson's response that said, is Bill Cosby right? And Michael Eric Dyson lays him out. Uh, now we see Charles Barkley coming on the scene, and Charles Barkley is saying certain things. So we lifting these five up, and Ferguson is one. But I'm asking, do you think that we're paying too much attention just to these four or five situations that we are missing the global destruction, dismantling of the black community. I need to hear from you all because yes. the millennial generation is marching, they're protesting, and perhaps their protest, I don't know, is it different than what we did in the 60s, in Montgomery, in the bus boycott? We had actual steps to take to remedy issues in our own community. I think you had your hand up first. Let's start. Okay. Um, I'll start out with the root of the problem that I feel is uh, what we're seeing in our world today is the absence of God. And it brings it back to what you were saying. Um, we can't have compassion for each other or anyone else if we don't know what love is. God is love, you know what I'm saying? And through media and video games and whatever else that we put into our minds. Whatever you feed grows, whatever you starve dies off. And this country um, and this world actually has been feeding themselves so much hate. Um, we've been desensitized from seeing other people murdered. We've been desensitized from, uh, at this point, I can't turn on news without hearing anything negative. So what I will say, um, first and foremost, the absence of God, and secondly, we can't. I know we're upset about all the things that are happening around the nation but we're not equipped to travel and put out these fires. So what we have to do to solve the problem is handle our jurisdiction. You need to handle these things, this, this that we're doing today, we need to be able to sit and talk and handle our communities. We need to have our own jurisdictions. What do you mean? What do you mean? What I mean by that is just like this that we're having here. Um, our kids, the new Martin Luther Kings and Malcolm X's is uh, Lil Wayne and Gucci Mane. Nah. I'm saying, say as, in, as in the people that they follow, okay. as in the people that inspire them. The reason why you see the murderous things going on in our neighborhoods is because every song that they play tells me that it's cool to go out here and shoot my brother. So hip hop is to blame? I'm not saying it's to blame. But it's media, it, it's one, it's, it's, it's it one part of a system of things that's guiding us into believing this is who we should be. We were made in God's image, so we were made to be great. So I believe that Satan, in a sense, we're going to get to the root of this. Mm -hmm. Satan, in a sense, has a tricky way of confusing everybody, getting you arguing with each other when the, when the root of the problem is he separated you all and made you not speak to each other, yeah. understand each other, or have any compassion. So being that we have no compassion for each other and we don't talk, and the young folks since Willie Lynch set it up and it's still going, young don't speak to the old. So we don't learn the potholes that they hit. We ain't trying to hear that. So therefore, the officer used to be an overseer. So now we got a problem with them. 
white people, when I, if I never hang around a black person in my life, if I turn on the TV or listen to the radio, I'd be scared, scared. too. Exactly. So we have to change the perception of how they see us. I wish there was more white people here today because they need to hear how we actually feel. And we need to change the perception of how we see each other. And we need to educate our communities, have these talks. We need to come together and handle our jurisdiction so there, no, there is no Michael Browns in our, in our city. There is no kids getting shot for guns because we understand, we talk to our police, and our city takes care of each other. So if every city did that and handled their jurisdiction, we don't have to be mad about what's happening in Chicago. Chicago's handling Chicago. We don't have, have to worry about what's happening in New York. New York's handling New York, and we handle our jurisdiction. Okay. Mr. Chester, yeah. The, the question you asked, I don't think it really is an either or um, answer on that. I think we should be concerned about uh, heavy handedness on the part of law enforcement and if they're jumping to shoot too quickly. I think we can be concerned about that. But at the same time, we also have to be concerned about the fact that, um, according to FBI statistics, I think this was last in 2008 or 2010, the number of homicide victims in the U.S. was about nearly 50% black for populations about 13% black. Yes, true. That's it. That is a big issue. We can, and about 93% of the homicides were black on black. When whites killed, there was about 81% whites on white. So the, the numbers are very similar in terms of the percentages, but we're killing at a much worse rate in terms of the total number of victims in any given year. That's a problem to me. And that's an issue I don't think we're doing nearly enough to, to hammer home, we gotta stop killing each other. I just did a column this week about a young girl who had gone to a party. Some people, uh, an argument started inside. People came out, at least two people were shooting. And the young girl who had just started college at TCC, 18 years old, was killed in the crossfire. That's a problem. We didn't like that much about that story when it happened. To me, that's a problem. So if we write too much, some people are going to criticize us. And if we don't write enough, some people are going to yeah. criticize us. The point of the matter is we're killing each other a lot here and across the country. And I don't really see enough attention being brought to how do we stop that? Why don't we care about each other enough? You know, how do you, why why, how do you, why are we killing each other so much? A lot of times over stupid stuff. Man, it's learned behavior. All behavior is learned behavior, and we've been talking about a behavior that a lot of people are doing, and they had to have learned this from somewhere. Mm -hmm. There was just a thing he just said about how it was from overseer to officer, and in all of this time, there's been, still been, like I said earlier, mass amounts of violence. This violence is not something that we just... We, that we just feel like we have to do or that's just something that's just coming out of nowhere. This is learned behavior. So really, if you want to get to the root of the problem, we need to go back and address and Wait, talk to yeah. everybody who's older than us and figure out hmm. why, what did y'all do to drop the ball and leave this on our lap? Because the young people, we always inherit whatever it is that our parents have for us. I can say right now, I have economic privilege because my pops did a real good job. And look at, I mean, the church didn't do well, and he's been able to pay for me to go to school, and I'm living a life that people in my position, that a lot of people that look like me, can't have. He was just talking earlier about how he's trying to figure out how he's going to be able to pay for school. Too many, I mean, but it's learned behavior, and the behavior is getting picked up from the people that we were around, or the people that were around, I mean, if parents weren't around, we end up being around somebody. And if their parents weren't around, they ended up being around somebody. And at some point in time, the behavior was picked up that this violence is necessary for me to be able to thrive in a community that would very much like to see me dead. We have to be the change we want to see, though. We do. We, we do have, have to be the change, the change we want to see. If we can't see. find a role model, you got to be one. I mean, but look at the role models that we got, though. Yeah. Nobody. You talked about how, you know, all these rappers and whatnot, mm -hmm. and they do a lot of these violent mm -hmm. songs, but the rappers that make the songs that are good for you, actually, get no play. they don't get no love. I no mean, Crit, Big Crit just dropped the album, and one of the songs he had was Lost Generation, and he's talking about my generation and about how things are. And it's not like it's our fault that we are living in this world. This world was like this before we got here. 
which is why I'm saying we've inherited problems from a prior generation, which Ooh. is apparently and, and Dr. You Barrett, you, you said that you, you made a point, one thing that we can do. Yep. And, you know, and I think that uh, if we kind of look at that and working in my world and, and edu education, you know, and maybe this can be a, a, a survey question to do later. Uh, how many right. people volunteer in schools or serve okay. as a mentor yes. or go in there to, to speak and show our youth an example that isn't what they're seeing on the media? That's a perfect segue. Per uh, perfect segue. Yeah, perfect segue. Uh, Dr. Manor, this came in, uh, came in, someone texted this in message. Can, we, can somebody please speak towards the elephant in the room, us, our personal responsibility? Exactly. And that's what you want to do, a positive step of what, 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 is, our, what is our responsibility? Okay. Well, Please, I can I take that, that one? Do you all have Please, can I take that one? <laughs> Please, can I take that one? Okay. <laughs> I, I hear you, young man, when you talk about inheriting a generation. But when I look at um, the civil rights movement and Dr. King, and I, I look at what they had to go through, it could be said that they inherited a generation where things were just horrific for them. We have not seen horrific until you have a dog that's biting you simply because you want to vote. We have not seen horrific because someone's beating you with a baton because you want to walk across a bridge so you can show that your right to vote is just as important as a white American right to vote. And so when I hear that, I, I think about some of the things that I've heard other younger people, your generation say, uh, because of slavery, because of the drugs that were pushed into the communities after the, the Vietnam War, and some other other factors, this is why we he, we are here. And what I will always say is this: if you are not willing to learn from your history, you will repeat it, and you cannot allow your history to be an excuse for why you are where you are. I heard someone say, "I don't vote because there is no one to vote for." Well, guess what? If you don't vote, you would never be on a grand jury. I, I didn't say I don't vote. I, well, people don't no, vote. No. Okay, you said people don't vote. People yeah, don't I vote said. because there's someone, there's no one to vote for. But if you don't vote, you would never be on a grand jury. You would never be on a special grand jury. You would never be in a position to make a decision in the Ferguson decision, the New York decision, and even the Cleveland decision that's coming up. You would never be in a position to be able to eradicate change. And the reason you won't be able to do so is because they pick grand juries from the voter registration roll. And we are talking about making change. One of the things, Pastor Marion, you said is, where do we go from here? I don't want just to talk about the problem. I want to talk about how we're going to come out of here with a solution. Well, if you want a solution, first start with the vote. People have died for the right to vote. And if you do not vote, you cannot be in a position to influence it. Secondly, you have also a responsibility to go back in the community and pull others out of the community where you were once. Yeah, yeah. That's why I have that heart of a servant because I grew up in a place called The Hole. It was one way in, one way out. And I saw a shooting on a regular. I, I saw it all go down on a regular. And my mom said to me, look, you are not your environment. You are bigger than your environment. That's why she said, pick up a book, boy. Because if you don't pick up a book, you will lose out on opportunities that are going to be afforded to someone else. And you got to be twice as good as your white counterpart. And so you're not going to be twice as good as your white counterpart if you're ignorant. Because ignorance is what kills us. And ignorance is not having knowledge. You have to have knowledge. I mean, we spoke about a, a, a whole lot of stuff. Yeah. Being an entrepreneur and, and things of that nature. Yes, they're the smarter generation, but they're not disciplined. You have to be disciplined. Everybody cannot run their own business because you won't get up out of the bed yeah. and go on a regular basis. So we're going to talk about the elephant in the room. We got to hold that mirror up and say, what is it that I am not doing on a consistent basis to see my community be better than what it is? That's what we have to do. Racism is real. No one in this room is going to deny that racism is not real. 
It is every much in our face on a regular systematic basis. But I would, I, I just refuse to allow racism to be the excuse for me not being able to be a responsible, a male adult in my community and pulling back others to be where they need to be on a regular basis. That's the elephant in the room. Perhaps we will not walk away with just one cause of our issue and our plight, uh, and we all believe in, in the generation of disconnect uh, because we aren't teaching our history. Yeah. Uh, are we teaching our history to our children? And I think that's what some of them are saying, that we have neglected to teach history. Absolutely. And they are repeating history because perhaps this yes. generation did not give to them what they needed. We gave them cars. We gave them Xboxes, we gave them yeah. cell phones, we gave them vacations, but we didn't give them a sense of identity through history. So now perhaps this, you know, how do you feel? If, if, if Officer Darren Wilson was, was black, how would you feel? Would, this, would, would they be national protest? No. I mean, there's a lot to deal with. Would there be a national pro, would we be angry at what has happened because another black man killed another black man? We don't see the same level of respect when it comes to those things. What does personal responsibility mean if I'm raised by a woman or an absent father who does not know anything about responsibility? So you, we, we talk about, I'm, I don't want to be on the panel. I'm, I, you <laughs> on the panel. You on the panel. <laughs> but come on, let's deal with this. We talk about personal responsibility. Person, doesn't, doesn't it need to be trained? Yeah. Yeah. If you want personal responsibility, you got to do this. I don't know what to do. Carlos hit it on the spot. Carlos hit it right on the nail with the mentorship, mm -hmm. uh, being able to go back into the communities with mentorship. And, and I hear, uh, Isaiah, what you're saying in reference to the generation not teaching the younger generation what it is that they need to do in order to be successful because wisdom is nothing but knowledge based upon experience, applied knowledge. Yeah, and so we do have a, a serious responsibility to go back into the community and teach our young males what it is, how to be a young male. Because right, when I grew in, up- I'm gonna jump in right yeah. here, how to be a young man. Jump how to in be really a young quick, male. Because we're gonna talk, Dr. Manny, and I know we have a lot, we wanna talk about solutions, but very quickly, another show of hands by engaging. How many males or females were raised in a single parent home without the father being there? Without the father being there. Could we show that slide as well? Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Man, if you see here, 67% African American males without a father. Uh, if also, the next slide, if we could show that quickly, if we could, the next slide talk about 63%, uh, and it just goes down all the percentages. First of all, I want to say, y'all are here, so you all did not, they're not part of that statistic. So thank you. It's just a blessing that you all are here. But what we want to find out and discuss, what impact does it have for a father? Not, and I know we only have a few minutes, Dr. Murray. We're going to finish up here. We're going to have one question and then talk about solutions. By, by nature, the hands I saw earlier and those who raised his fathers, we just saw the previous slide uh, go back 67% of fatherlessness. 67% of fatherlessness. And, and I got an email, I'm reading some of the emails that we're getting in as well. Uh, and some, well, why, why, weren't there black, why, why weren't there black women on the panel? Because we're starting off with black males. Uh, and so maybe down the road we will have that, but we gotta start somewhere. And I think the main issue is fatherlessness, dealing with black males, the absence of men in their lives. Um, but some of you all made it, I'm not sure, not you all, but generation uh, of baby boomers made it without a father. How is this generation struggling even now? Because they, they don't have father figures in their lives. I think, um, first of all, the father is very important to the whole family structure because the father is the blueprint to what a man is supposed to be. And he's a forecast to what that little girl is supposed to look forward to. And I think um, in the baby boomer generation, even if a father wasn't in place, the way that they did things was it takes a village. You know what I mean? So you had uncles, you had right. other men around that would, hey boy, you know, get it together, you know, pull your pants up, you know, that's who, now it's made to where we can't speak to the youth. They make it, the system has made it to where you can't whip your children, mm -hmm. though, you know, we still handle our business inside <laughs> the house. 
But it's been made to where that separation, this Willie Lynch syndrome of cell separation has happened so the knowledge doesn't get through. And um, I think that it's very important for if you don't have a father in the household that you find another inspiration. And it's, it's up to the older generation to become that inspiration for our men, young men out here because otherwise they have no bl blueprint to follow other than what they see on that television or hear in that rap song. From a multi-generational perspective, and I'm gonna go back to something that Mr. Bell said about a uh, young boy, who, 16 year old who shot and his father was in jail. That's the legacy that some fathers leave their children, incarceration. Mm -hmm. uh, drugs, alcohol, mental illness, those are elements that impact the family and our communities where a lot of the crime does occur. You, these are households where you learn how not to talk, how not to feel, and the biggest feeling that you have sometimes because of your condition, your hopelessness, and wanting a part of the American dream is anger. And that anger manifests itself in a lot of ways. That's why a lot of young men can commit a crime and have no remorse about it, because that anger is the driving force and it's years of anger. How are we gonna rectify that? In a quick sense, is, uh, and something uh, that I've heard already, go to the communities. Go and talk to these young men. Let them know how, what they should feel. The messages when I was growing up is that was, take it like a man, you know. Uh, and, and until I started reading some uh, uh, material by uh, T.D. Jates, and I was in a car accident myself and saw my father cry for the first time, I said, wow, he's not taking it like a man. <laughs> so uh, it taught me that men do have feelings. We need to talk about what we feel. And I did a group with a, a, a group of women uh, earlier this week, and they told me, we never had a man talk to us the way that you're talking to us with feelings. And I just think we have to show ourselves that we can feel. Uh, get through the anger, because there are sometimes defense mechanisms that people use to keep you away but don't go away. Keep coming, keep coming. Yeah. Yeah, so do, do, you, do you all feel, do you all feel that every male and every biological father is a good role model? Of course not. Every person isn't a good person. Doesn't mean they don't have the capacity to be, but sometimes that's just what they are. I mean, personal responsibility, we talked about that. For, for whatever situation, whatever time period, you make all of your own decisions. And those consequences that come from those are a result of the decisions that you made. So if people aren't taking responsibility for that, and then that, that trend passes on. So then you see people, you have a learned behavior of not taking responsibility. You have a learned behavior of this violence and aggression. You have this learned behavior of suppressing your emotions. And all of these things culminate, so it's basically like you're over, you're over pressurizing the boiler. It's going to explode, and when it explodes, it'll be catastrophic. I mean, I think it comes from resentment of fathers. Uh, when a father leaves or a father is never there, uh, a boy, he never learns like love or how to treat a woman, first of all. He never learns how to act when something goes wrong. So he has resentment for his father See, my father left the house just because he wasn't happy with the marriage. He made sure, he made a fact to stay in my life because he didn't have a father in his life. So he knows how hard it is to grow up without that, without that training and without that nurturing that only a father can give and only a father can teach you how to be a man. So if anything that I take from my father is you make the bed that you sleep in and he slept in the bed and he made sure that that bed stayed together. So I, that's, that's what I take from it. So I don't, I don't have any resentment for him. I love that man, that's my man, that's my, that's my role dog. That's, the, that's that guy that I'll go to if anything's wrong, I'll talk to him about anything. So he made sure that I knew that. So if I do anything with my son is to make sure that he knows that I'm there. I'm that one. I don't want him to go to anybody else about anything. It's just that's me, because I made him. That's good. That's good. Dr. Man, we have about six minutes, and I know that we want to talk about solutions. Um, and, and I know that we want to frame the conversation, because that's what 
one of your desires that we leave with some type of action plan. If it's one step or two steps, uh, the church. I don't know who the Ooh. pastor is here, but this is a beautiful church, and I, I don't know who the pastor may be here. <laughs> but with, with the church, is it part of the solution? Is it part of the solution? Sure. I, and, I, and I'll jump on that one. Um, last month, um, I worked for my superintendent in Norfolk. So we actually had our faith summit in, in Norfolk um, where, you know, a lot of times, a lot of people feel it's cliche to, uh, you know, to bring the religions and, you know, into schools and all this other stuff. But um, I'm glad that I have a leader um, in a school administration who understands that um, it's going to take the entire village. And that's every component. And that includes the religious aspect of our, our community. So we came together for a faith summit, and what we came out of that was one thing, because it's so big, and sometimes some people, when you approach things, you, you, you see this big you know, mountain of things, like, you know, how, how in the world am I gonna do anything? But we challenged people to do one thing, whether that was to come and be a mentor, whether that was to be a reading buddy, so we made sure that those third graders were on their reading, grade level, one thing. And a lot of times, a lot of us, we get out, we make it, and it's like, okay, I, I got mine. And that's the other thing that we really haven't talked about, you know, that we have a generation at a point right now where a lot of people are on, well, I've got mine, I've got so much other things I gotta worry about, I don't need to be worrying about anybody else. But we have to challenge you to say that you gotta give back. If we want to move forward as a generation, we wanna move forward as a people, you know, we even have lost sight. You know, it's hard for us when we talk about slavery because we don't know where we really, what is our cultural piece? You know, I'm, I'm mixed, I'm mixed with a whole bunch of stuff. You know, so where, where do you fit? In. You know, what, what is that cultural piece in there? So to be able to see somebody, you know, and, I, and, I'll, use, and I'll close with this one example. My nephew, you know, I've got two of them. My youngest nephew, A.B. on a roll, both of them. have never had to spank my nephews or anything. My, my, my sister's a single parent, okay? But they know that Uncle C ain't playing. And Uncle C will talk to you. But my nephew came out here with a failing grade in writing. And my sister called me up and said, your nephew will fail writing. I'm like, for what? So I had to talk with him. And he said, well, Uncle C, all the other kids in class, they ain't doing what they're supposed to do, so I gotta do what I gotta do. I said, because you ain't the other kids. And you got my last name. I said, and so unless you want Uncle C to show up in your classroom and pull you out and embarrass you, then you're gonna do what you're supposed to do. Do we understand? Yes, Uncle C. And see, sometimes it's just that, that accountability. I didn't have a father in my household, but I had accountability. I had individuals in my church, I had mentors, I had teachers, I had other individuals who were, I was accountable to. I didn't want to let them down. But the problem is, is that, well, the first step that we got to do is we got to come into our communities. In the first place you can start with a youth is get in the school. Go in a school. I challenge you, you want to step? Go in a school. Let a kid know that you care. If you let them know that you care, I can guarantee you we'll start making some progress. Let a kid know that you care. You, you, you talk about the church, whether we are um, a factor in what we're seeing in our communities. And, and I just think about how the Bible says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, then when I hear from heaven, I'll, I'll forgive their sins and I'll heal their lands. You know, as the church, we're supposed to be a light on the hill. And we're supposed to be that beacon that the community really is looking towards. It's not the government that's gonna make things correct. Come on, it's a praying church. Come on, it's a fasting church. It's an active church who is saying, okay, if dad is not there, come on deacons, let's go out here in this community and let's go do such and such. If mom is not doing what she's supposed to do, or maybe mom can't help her help kids with homework. Well, let's do a GED program to help mom learn how to read so she can get a job to be an example to her kids. We are that beacon. We have to be the ones that say, I will be the church. The church is not these four walls. The church is in us. We got to go out to the schools and to the communities and be what is missing in the lives. Because all you're seeing is brokenness. That's all you're seeing. Everything, when we talk about the violence and, and, and the, um, the lack of education or the lack of priorities and all the other uh, issues that everyone sees is brokenness. We are dealing with brokenness in the community, and God can heal anything. And if he can heal it, he wants to use you and I to be the ones to bring that, that type of healing to the community. And as we draw some conclusions, um, the 
church has to be relevant. Many of us were raised as baby boomers, do what I say, not what I do. I'm hearing from the millennial generation that that day is over. They don't just want to hear what you say. They are watching what you do. Thus, we have perhaps some have lived hypocritical lives in front of our own children. And the word of God says, the parents ate the sour grapes and the children got the sour taste. The parents ate the sour grapes, but the children got the sour taste. Um, I'm taking a professional liberty. Um, I don't like the current model of church. I'm more with Gandhi, who says, I love your Christ, but I don't love you Christians. Um, I'm, and, and, and keeping it in respect, this church, not the building, the church, the called out believer in Christ for me, is the person that humbles himself before God. I, even as a pastor, oftentimes become very disenchanted with pastoring and church life because we have too many daddy graces in the church. When I say daddy grace, it's all about the pastor, it's all about the bishop, it's all about the priests. And we have all of these things, but yet we don't give time for, we now in the church as leaders are now looking like corporate America. The CEO has a Learjet and there's nothing wrong with getting around and travel. I'm gonna ride one of yours one day. Y'all gonna invite me to get on board with one of you all one day. There's nothing wrong with that. But I'm hearing from, from not, and I, that we're out of touch. Why the church is pivotal. And I stand with you, and I stand on the, the church in the black community and everywhere. It's a sin issue. The bottom line, what's going on is a sin issue. When I de devalue people, it's a sin issue. When I murder, it's a sin issue. When I lie on you, it's a sin issue. When I misuse truth for my own advantage, it's a sin issue. So leaders got to get to a place where it's not about us. We get mad at Al Shopton, we call him opportunist. But at least the brother shows up at pivotal issues. I know y'all, we don't, we don't like him. A lot of folks don't like him. Huh? That's real. Well, he shows up. I mean, he's going to show up. And because he's there, immediately going to show up to see what, what he's going to do or what he's going to say. He's going to make a fool of himself or what he's going to do. But he shows up. So as we draw our conclusion, you know, I don't know. Do you see the church being irrelevant? Do you see the church? Can, can the church do more? Can the church do so, more? And what, the, what does it more look like? The church kinda, can't. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. You got it. The church can do more. I think all the churches, especially in the city of Portsmouth, if, if we start working together opposed to trying to have the best church, we could do a lot to curtail a lot of the problems in the city of Portland. Um, a, a lot of the big churches, not talking about specifically yours, but a lot of them worry about who has more members and yeah. instead of how many members we can help outside of the church. Yes. When you have some of the smaller churches out there doing a lot, I have a friend who, who does a lot in the community, and he has a smaller church, but all he gets is negative feedback that he's an opportunist. But when you have the big churches, they talk about how much they care when a lot of the stuff they do is for show. So I think if all the churches start to work together, I think a lot of the problems that exist can be coattail and it can fix a lot of the issues that we have. I think what he said kind of about sums it up. There, the church definitely is useful and it should be and will be a pivotal part of progress moving forward it always has been I mean the church has been especially in black communities the church has been a platform for us to be able to come together and talk like how we are right now I mean this isn't the first time something like this has happened it might not have happened in a while but this isn't the first time that it has happened and it shouldn't be the last time so what he just said is churches we I mean but that what he said is bigger than just churches that should be applied to everything I mean right. to our individual lives is you have a general disconnect. You have the general, the whole, most of the world, most people in the world believe that they're separate from other people in the world. But that's a lie. We are all connected because if, as soon as you wake up, as soon as you were born, as soon as you were conceived, even before you went, when you were 
just a sperm cell, the one that made it, you know? Like when you were the one <laughs> sperm that made it, you and you were in this world, you were automatically connected to everybody else because what what you are in, like your, your mother's womb, is basically, it's, it's all the same material that was around. I mean, what you are right now, what you are made out of right now, is different than what you were made out of when you were born. Your, those skin cells, your bones, everything, is completely different. And that means that everything that you were has moved on to a different place and is quite possibly in another person right now. We are all connected. We breathe the same air, we breathe on the same land, we got the same water sources. And, and the, at the end of the day, I honestly feel like we all believe in, you know, there's a supreme being. Yeah. And even with people having their different religious views, we're still all connected. So all the churches need to be connected so that they can connect these disconnected people. So that we can fix the overall disconnect that has led to all of these problems. So that we can find a way to rebalance ourselves. Because the church, the world, people, we're all centered off balance, you know. I mean, like he said, there's no God. There's people not connected to how God wanted us to be connected. Keeping us right on time. It's uh, 12.06. How did you want to close yourself, I'll, I'll, Dr. Manager, I'll, how you want to? Man, I don't know. We lose a lot of time. I want to go down on this quickly. You don't have a, a short moment. Okay. Tell us what is a vital step for the church. I mean, we've got to start here for the families. If you can give us something, maybe just give us a thought. Um, what, do we, what, do, what, what needs to take place? I mean, we all have our different perspectives, but can we agree on something? I know Grove is going to continue be, to be involved in community, but I want to hear what the needs are. So what areas, um, you know, do you feel, because you are, you are a panelist today, you're the ones who make this thing happen. What do, we need, what do we need to go next? What is a step? What is just a quick step that perhaps we can say we're going to take next? I think and that we didn't um, get into mental health issues in, in the black community. That's a major, oh God, elephant that black folk don't want to deal with, mental health. And I, go ahead, but um, That's a serious issue in our community. community. Uh, I think when you're looking at uh, treating people from a holistic perspective, uh, spirituality is significant. I agree that there is, um, we are the church, and something you said earlier, we're the ecclesia church, we're the visible church outside of here, is that made of the walls. We need to go to the communities. Uh, back, um, t relating it to a baby boomer's perspective, the church came to the communities. They came to the communities uh, and they brought us, brought us out, brought us to the church. Churches wanna go out and just do light things in the community. They don't maintain stability tell me one or presence thing, in the tell community. Me, tell me one thing that we can leave here and say that this is what we can I think we need to take this form and invite uh, uh, the people from the community, bring them to us, uh, any location, be this church or any church, but we need to bring the people that need to hear the message and let them know that we hear, okay. we're here for them. Caring and showing care for an individual is an initial step, and that's what the church is not about just taking care of parishioners. We need to go out. Okay. I, I think based on wherever a church is, what are the needs of the neighborhoods? Is it mentoring? Is it uh, GED teaching? Is it computer training? Is it job skills? You don't have to necessarily do it all yourself because there are other things out there that you can, you can latch on to and you can network with. And But finding out what the people immediately around your Church needs and trying to and try to satisfy that, especially where it comes to young black men. I agree with the mentoring. I think the mentoring piece is the biggest element, particularly uh, in the lives of these young men who don't have a father figure. They need to see men who take care of their home, take care of their wives, take care of their kids, who uh, love their wives and 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 not the hypocrites that you spoke to earlier in reference to how they may perceive the church. But on the same line, I also believe in the church being a leader concerning civic engagement. Yes. A lot of people do not understand how that the grand jury and the special grand jury process works. Yes. And so we need to educate our people concerning how those processes work and 
what it is that they can do to change it. And a very easy uh, solution to change it is at least be eligible to be on a grand jury or a special grand jury. And the only way you can be eligible is to vote. So what about doing voter registration drives? Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, respect the faith. Continue with God's teaching, but discuss in real talk. Yeah, I mean, I agree with what everyone else said. Forums like this need to continue and involve, you know, more of everyone, you know what I mean? Not just the black, but the white, the youth, um, so everyone can hear each other and understand each other and educate our community and getting them in a, a position to where we're all on the same page with progress. Okay. What I think the church should do with their um, evangelistic attempts should be less based on religion and more based on God. Now, it might sound crazy. People are afraid of religion, especially people of my generation. They're afraid of the word religion because they know what came from, like especially the earlier Christians. The earlier Christians, they killed people because they didn't believe in their religion. So if you teach them God and God's teachings instead of the religion of Christianity, they might be more susceptible <laughs> in being good people and then they'll find God and they'll believe in Christ and they'll love Christ and then they can go to heaven like the rest of y'all beautiful people. <laughs> Quickly, yeah, y'all go through. What can the church do to improve the current situation? Um, well, so far people have been hitting on really good topics, but uh, I think one of the main things people with church is going to need to do, like he just said, is somewhat of a, a step away from a more traditional religion and just getting back to the root of it all. I mean, the root of it all is supposed to be love and tolerance mm -hmm. and understanding that you're connected to these people, so therefore you shouldn't do harm to them because in a sense, you're essentially doing harm to yourself. So I think it's, it's, it has to go down back to proper teaching, um, a, better, a better education, and not so much, you know, a formal education where, well, the school system needs to change, but not so much just a formal education, but just educating people in general and providing people with resources so that they can educate themselves in their spare time. Uh, let's take the scripture, uh, Proverbs 27, 17. Iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. What we need to do is put the church directly in the community because a lot of time the community is not gonna come to the church, especially the areas that we know are bad areas, are crime infested areas instead of you know, just rolling our windows up and cruising through those areas. How about we go to those areas and make a change? I agree with it. I agree with everything that's been said. Um, again, I just go back, lead by example, be a mentor, be an accountability partner. All right. Well, one of the things I was gonna say was already said, but um, I, I think mentoring is, is also a good thing, but we also gotta make sure it's the right mentor. They gotta be somebody that the, per the people we need to reach can relate to. It can't just be anybody. Mm -hmm. I want to just thank you. Uh, I get calls from the Portsmouth Police Department and Bar Department looking for black candidates. And a lot of them can't qualify because they have records felonies. Thank you for not being perfect, but for, n for not having a felony. <laughs> <laughs> we need to see faces like yours in the streets and, and it's our hopes that when you stop someone it's done out of respect and we know you will it's done out of I'm doing my job because you're going to see a lot of things and I hope that those things do not distort your view of humanity that God has called you to serve and protect Many of you have emailed and said, open the floor up. And, and because we want to respect their time, because, you know, some of us can stay all day. But we told them noon. Uh, we told them that they will be here by noon, leave by noon. And here it is. They've been sitting 15 minutes after the fact. And so I'm respecting their time. Um, and I know that many people want to open up on the floor. And there's a lot of things we can discuss. Um, I'm just asking, are there any men who feel that with a little assistance that you're ready to be treated
trained as a mentor, whether this church or another church, because believe me, it's not about growth. It's about the kingdom of people. Uh, and so I'm not sure how, and we all are busy, but let's shift our priorities. And I believe that women, you make a difference, but today it isn't about you. I'm sorry, and I'm glad you're here. Please come back the next time we have it. You, are, you have been the backbone of our families and our churches and of our lives. Thank you. But this, this moment ain't about you. It's about the absent fathers and men who are not in our lives. Because I, men make a difference. I'm asking. I'm asking. I'm asking for mentors who need to be trained. And believe me, it doesn't matter where, we will have a, let's do this, let's, let's plan to have a, 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 a Hampton Roads Forum to train mentors. That's what we'll do. Hampton Roads, we'll meet anywhere, we'll, we'll, we'll cross the bridge to come to Newport News or Hampton. It doesn't matter where it is, I think that we need to have training for mentors and and, and there are many people who would help Grove host that moment to have men come in and, you know, show black men what it means to mentor. And I guarantee you, out of that, we'll get more men. But they got to come up. But we can't look at them like they're crazy because they come with dreads. Jesus had, Jesus and our come of vernacular may have had dreads. So we can't look at folk funny. So one of the first things we'll do in the next couple of months is get with other leaders who are on the panel and have a community you know, tutorial program moment on how to build mentors. And at least we can start with that. At least we can start with that. Uh, and the force behind that will be centered men who want to duplicate that God nature in other young men and other young women. Because at the end of the day, it ain't about us as individuals. It's about us as a collective group of human, humans whom God so loved that it gave his only begotten son. So thank you for being here. Alonzo's going to kind of wrap this up. Um, and I know and, um, we have a lot of questions coming up. And I'm a 13-year-old girl looking. It, 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 I'm 13. I'm asking, where, where are the fathers in my generation? She's 13. I'm asking, where are the fathers in my generation? And so through this mentoring uh, function, because we had to change priorities. We may not be able to go on a vacation for nine days, maybe seven, because we have two days we want to make sure we spend with people. Let's get the men out of the church, in the church, but the church has to change too. Can you put your hands together for our panel who took their time? Personally speaking, God has been telling Melvin Mariner more, more. I'm not a church planner. I mean, I'm not trying to start churches or everywhere. I'm just trying to stabilize the ones we have. God has given it my life, and I know my purpose is not just a pastor. It is to reach black men, to all men, but especially black men. And so that's why I have a heart for what, what these brothers have said and what they're doing. And I know my passion will help hopefully will help us achieve what God has called uh, and being more and giving more because to whom much is given, much is required. Alonzo, thank you so much for sharing. Come on. Yes, very quickly.
text that information? Right, that's what I was just about to okay, say. Go ahead. Pastor. You got yes, it. Sir. I'm going to shut up. You got it, man. No, go no. ahead. I ain't taking you shut up. No, no. <laughs> no go ahead. No, yes, sir. If we could text right before you leave, what did you think about the event? What did we miss? And just as his brother said, your contact information, and we're going to get it. It's going to go to our team, and we will be in contact with you. As you see, this is strong to the pastor's heart, near to, near to his heart. So if you could send your information. But we also want to know, did we make it? Did we, what did you think about the event? What could we change? What could we do the next time? What things could we uh, do better? So we're really interested because as you see, this is a passion for our people, not just males, but our people, our people, our people. I'm gonna be quiet and, and Pastor Barbie's gonna come and he has a, just a few moments and then we're gonna close out. Thank you all. Amen. Do, do we need to get that text number back up there so everybody can see it? Two, two, three, three, three. Two two three 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 two two three three three. And if you don't have it for a phone, use your neighbor's phone. <laughs> no, if you don't have it, use your neighbor's phone to text the information for yourself. Amen. Thank y'all so much for coming out. Um, real quick, just to kind of reiterate, we talked, we covered a lot of ground here today. Um, again, our goal was to begin a dialogue. Um, start with some very practical solutions. I think we, we did accomplish both of those goals. Um, as Pastor has said, alluded to already, this is the first of several other initiatives, several other type of things that we will be doing. It probably won't look like this every time, um, but we'll have some different things going on. Um, the, the question about, you know, the role of the church, um, you know, some things that were put out there, very practical um, for our church and others of you who are members of churches, um, we, we got to do this together. Um, go out to the community. Um, bring people to these type of events. Make sure that we're going out and caring for people. Um, assess the community and meet the needs based on what you get from the assessment in that community. Obviously, the mentoring program, that's a huge piece. That's something our men's ministry has already begun to talk about and to put some things in motion. Civic education, specifically a voter registration drive. That's some things that we have done before. I know many of you have participated in things like that, your churches and et cetera, but these are things that we got to stay on the wall for. Uh, respectful, real talk forums such as this. I appreciate uh, the views, the veracity of everybody expressed on this panel. Um, moving away uh, from, from, from religion, quote unquote, um, and really dealing with matters of faith. Education, that's, that's been a, a backbone for our community uh, since we've been in this country. Lead by example. I don't think it gets any more plainer than that. And our pastor uh, has laid it out there in terms of one quantifiable step, um, uh, developing a Hampton Roads Forum to train and develop mentors. And so that's where we're moving to uh, next. Um, allow me to thank, uh, um, we just gave them applause, but one more time, let's appreciate our panel for their time. Um, our men's ministry, our men's ministry leaders, thank you so much. And if you're a member of this church, um, all our men, thank you so much for coming and bringing other men with you from the community who may not be members of our church. Thank you to all of you who have come near and far, who are members and friends of this church and part of this community. We thank you so much for your uh, appreciation for you uh, coming today. Um, uh, and lastly, we certainly want to thank our pastor. Let's appreciate the senior pastor the creator and leader of this event, Dr. Melvin Mariner. Let's pray together, and then if you remember, to my left, your right, uh, we do have a, a reception going on, food. We can continue the dialogue even. Our panelists will be there, so hopefully you will be too. Uh, we'll enjoy some food together, and we'll continue to discuss what the things that we've dealt with on today. Gracious Father, we thank you for this moment, for this opportunity that you have given us, Lord. Thank you for all those who have made their way out on a Saturday. Uh, many of them have many other things that are in front of them today, and they didn't think it robbery to come here uh, and for us to begin this dialogue about these very prevalent and significant issues that ultimately don't just impact our community or our race or ethnicity, but it is a human problem. It is a sin issue. It is a people problem, Father. Help us to be catalysts for transformation, catalysts for change, Lord. We thank you for this moment. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you so for coming.